Ladies and gentlemen, let us start, let us commence by starting at the beginning. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to uh, uh, chair this panel, uh, which uh, deals with the past. And as I mentioned to uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, my good friend, uh, Eli Rubenstein, uh, every day when I go into the National Archives and Records Administration, NARA, on Pennsylvania, uh, Avenue in Washington, D.C., inscribed on the side of the building in very large letters are the words, the past is prologue. And I think that's, uh, that's a good way to, uh, uh, to, to get into a panel like this because we have three distinguished participants uh, in the negotiations which led to uh, uh, the peace treaty, uh, distinguished in their individual uh, uh, careers and uh, certainly distinguished by their successful efforts uh, before, during, and after uh, the peace treaty. Uh, I will start with just a tiny story. Uh, I, having been ambassador, uh, having first been deputy chief, 79 to 82, where I worked with Ellie on so many matters, including the multinational force and observers. Uh, which has its uh, utility as a precedent uh, for the future. Uh, I came back as ambassador under President uh, Reagan uh, at the very end in uh, 1988, uh, stayed through uh, the Madrid Peace Conference, which was a notable achievement, as you've heard already, uh, and uh, retired in 92. In 93, to my amazement, the Clinton administration asked me to come back for a couple of months. Uh, the couple of months stretched out. And during that period, I can well remember uh, Eli Rubenstein on the Israeli side working the corridors and the couches <laughs> in Washington uh, 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 very, very ably uh, and his Jordanian counterparts. And then came a moment where I was about to fly to sail off the southern coast of Turkey uh, arrangements had already been made for a flight leaving at noon. The phone rang and uh, it was the Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin asking me to come alone to see him urgently. It was at the end of uh, September, I think it was a Monday or Tuesday, September 1993. I took my deputy, uh, Jim LaRocca, who later became ambassador to Kuwait, a distinguished diplomat, uh, in the limo with me over to the defense ministry, and I went in alone, and uh, uh, the prime minister uh, greeted me. He had uh, General Danny Yatom in, in the room, and he said, uh, Bill, I want to confide to you that I have just met secretly with His Majesty the King, and we have made the break, and his brother, uh, Prince Hassan, and we have made the breakthrough, which gives me the confidence to tell you we are going to have a peace conference, we're going to have a peace treaty. Uh, there's a lot to be worked out and so forth, but I wanted you to know that. Uh, he said uh, uh, there were documents done, uh, drafted uh, and presented by Prince Hassan. Uh, I gave an undertaking to His Majesty that uh, His Majesty would convey these in his own way to your United States government, and therefore I can't give you those uh, documents, Bill, but if you go into the next room, Danny Yatom's office, you can read them. So I dashed into General Yatom's office and read what I could. Uh, these were largely uh, under the rubric of economic security, uh, Jordanian position papers. Then I raced out to my limo, briefed my deputy chief of mission, said, you send the cable, and I flew to Turkey. And of all the many, many exciting times I had in Israel, that day uh, was, uh, was uh, really a highlight. Now, as we go into this panel and beyond, uh, we are properly focusing today to the day, the 15th anniversary of the peace treaty, uh, and it is only appropriate that we concentrate on Israeli-Palestinian matters. But, as has been uh, presented by others, uh, especially in the message read by uh, uh, Ambassador Professor Hadadin, uh, there are many, many other aspects. And I would ask the panelists, the participants, observers, 
not only today, but in tomorrow's academic session, there is an academic uh, session tomorrow as well, to reflect not only on the significance of this in bilateral terms, uh, Israeli-Jordanian, but in the interconnectivity, uh, what lessons uh, can be learned as applicable to the Palestinian problem, to the Syrian, the Lebanese problem, uh, the Egyptian uh, inevitable uh, participation in all of this. That's the inner ring. And then looking to a, a next concentric ring, Iraq, Turkey, uh, uh, the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, beyond to uh, even the Central Asian republics, the European uh, participation and contributions in all of this, Afghanistan, and the continued, ever-growing concept of the Middle East as, it, as it, it must inevitably expand because of the interconnectivity. In that regard, if you look at uh, the tremendous debate which is going on in my country about how to cope with the problem of uh, Afghanistan, you, you know, you simply, in my view, cannot cope with Afghanistan alone. There is an inevitable Pakistani part uh, to it. When you address the Pakistani problem, you cannot delink that from the uh, Kashmiri problem and uh, the fact that they've had several wars with India, and it goes on and on. So if you'll bear that in mind, uh, I think it would be uh, well worthwhile. Without further ado, I would now like to call on uh, Justice Ellie Rubenstein, with whom I started to work way back in 1979 as a fledgling deputy chief of mission here, and we went through many, many uh, very interesting episodes together. Uh, he uh, came up the ladder in legal affairs. Uh, he was with uh, the foreign ministry for years uh, and rose to be their legal advisor. He served as government secretary for four different administrations, uh, heading all kinds of uh, special missions uh, uh, in uh, regard to the preparations for the Madrid Peace Conference uh, and, of course, uh, played a key role uh, in the uh, Jordanian peace treaty negotiations. Skipping back a little bit, during that session with Itzhak Rabin in late September 1993, I came a moment when I said, and who accompany you, Mr. Prime Minister? And he said, Ephraim Halevi, Eli Rubinstein, and uh, I believe Eitan Haba uh, uh, were along. And if he were here, even in his absence, I would like in that respect to pay great tribute and respect to Ephraim La Levy. Uh, <laughs> uh, he may have described himself as the man in the shadows, but believe me, he played a crucial role uh, in this, as in so many other peace endeavors. And one could go on uh, at some length uh, on the role of certain key personalities, one of them here at the table uh, uh, as a panelist, uh, in security intelligence matters and their contributions uh, to the making of peace. But with no further ado, I'll call on Justice uh, Elie Rubenstein uh, at, this, uh, at this juncture. Well, thank you very much. Such a pleasure to, always, to see you. His claim to fame is not only that he was a TCM and then ambassador here twice, but also that his wife of Greek origin knows some Yiddish, so, which is uh, uh, something to be uh, uh, commemorated and mentioned. The, uh, I can't resist telling the old story about that I, was, I heard many a time from Joe, Joe Sisko, who you may remember, was the Undersecretary of State under Kissinger in the old days. I just can't resist. It's the, about this guy who was the only survivor of the flood in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, back in 1889, and then made his living for 60 years on lecturing on how I survived that flood. And finally, he got to the Almighty, as would happen to all of us, and uh, he was told by the angel in charge, uh, look, we have a club of the newcomers here. Why won't you uh, talk to us and introduce yourself? Says, fine. Says, what's the topic? He says, how I survived the Johnstown, Pennsylvania flood back in 1889. And the 
uh, angel says, look, this is such a narrow topic. Why won't you pick something more universal? And the person says, that's all I know. I made my living on it. And the angel says, OK, if you want to do that, go ahead. But you should know that Noah is going to be in the audience. <laughs> and not only do we have here Noah Kinauti, who was our water negotiator as counterpart to uh, my friend Dr. Hadadin, but uh, this, uh, whoever goes to synagogue, this week was the Noah portion of the Bible. So here is Noah again. Now, uh, uh, despite uh, Bill's urging, I can't speak about current affairs because of uh, the, uh, I'm making a living as a justice on the court and we, we're supposed to be like monks in a bubble, so I will not talk current events. I will just talk history. And I'm glad to see Ambassador El Aid. Aid means coming back. And he comes back. He was in the negotiations. He comes here. God bless you. Uh, and I'm, of course, very happy to be with my two friends on the uh, panel here. Dr. Khatadin was a, uh, one of the key negotiators, in turn, uh, not only on water, mainly on water, but he also was a key negotiator of the first agreement that we I did with Jordan, which was called the Common Agenda. And uh, uh, General Abu Rashid uh, was the chief liaison officer for the Jordanian uh, military establishment with our side. And he, together with his Israeli counterpart, uh, General Spiegel, they uh, brought to the, to the ceremony of the Treaty of Peace the maps, the huge maps and they had them initialed and signed in those days. Everybody naturally mentioned Prime Minister Rabin and King Hussein. This week is the, the Memorial Day, 14 years, for Yitzhak Rabin, who was our leader at the negotiations and uh, who signed the Treaty of Peace. And a few years later, King Hussein died. These two leaders are forever enshrined in the history of the area and of the peace efforts. And of course, it is worthwhile mentioning them. And on a happier note, uh, uh, two messages we read here from Prince Hassan, one of the, so to speak, unknown heroes, or at least uh, not well enough credited heroes of the Treaty of Peace. We worked with him very closely, including at his home. And uh, Dr. Majali, my friend, who was the uh, first chief negotiator for Jordan, my counterpart, and then he was replaced by Dr. Taraune, also later a Prime Minister of Jordan. In my own uh, uh, participation in the work with Jordan it goes back to the mid 80s, 1986. And I'd like to say here something methodological. All over the, all along the way, and this goes back also to the 49 armistice agreement with Jordan there were sort of two levels of negotiations which complemented each other and were very important. One was the official and uh, uh, representative delegation. And I saw my deputy ambassador, Ben Su, who was with us uh, th those, in those years, the, and some other uh, friends. And I apologize to whoever I will not mention just because of time constraints and senility, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, so there was the level of the delegation that negotiated, it was very important because you can't negotiating, you can't negotiate documents, you can't do committees, you can't do these kind of things in any clandestine way. But uh, uh, there was also a confidential channel which was called by Prince Hassan in those days the safety net, which had the, uh, a few of the negotiators as well as the heads of the countries uh, meet occasionally 
to, it could be either Rabin with in Hussein, could be uh, as uh, uh, Rabin with, with King Hussein and Prince Hassan could be us with King Hussein and, uh, and, uh, and Hassan Halevi, which was uh, mentioned, and his credit is proper, and others. And this helped very much in shaping the negotiation. I'm mentioning that because the methodology uh, of having these two levels was uh, super helpful in the negotiations. I would also mention here, you know, there's always the, the question in history whether uh, ideas make history or people, persons, personalities make history. Uh, I'm always, uh, I always like the, the, the golden path, the middle road, and I think both. But in, in this respect, with Jordan, the fact that there was a lot of uh, respect between the two sides, which basically go back historically to a relationship that developed between late King Abdallah the I in the 20s, in the 1920s, and on in the 30s, 40s, uh, during the 1948 uh, war and so on. Uh, the, the relationship with the Hashemite house, which were semi-confidential, confidential over the years, but had their effect and the respect between the heads of the countries, between the people on the delegations, this created a, uh, a good uh, uh, springboard, a good uh, infrastructure for fruitful negotiation, and I think this is worth mentioning. The, uh, I myself participated, as I said, in uh, contact with Jordan from 1986, I believe, and uh, in a few meetings with uh, Prime, Minister Sham Prime Minister Shamir and uh, King Hussein and uh, also on the eve of the Gulf War and in other levels uh, over a, a number of years. It became a reality in terms of the public eye in Madrid in 1991. And I remember meeting Dr. Majali that day. And Dr. Majali, uh, uh, when, when we met, I was uh, 44, he was 66, I believe, or something, and uh, we leave our homes uh, just one and a half hour from each other, including the, 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 the uh, customs, from Jerusalem to Amman, and, and still he said to me, and he was involved as a young medical officer in 48 in the war, he said, you're the first Israeli that I meet. And I remember I felt that, well, it's time. It's time if this is what is, has happened. And, uh, the, uh, and Madrid was indeed the first official public diplomatic table around which Israel sat with uh, Jordan and the Palestinians. They were together at the time as part of the agreement that was reached procedurally. And uh, uh, of course, with the Syrians, with the uh, Lebanese, it, it gave you a lot of satisfaction. I myself am a veteran of the peace negotiations with Egypt and also participated over the years in negotiations with Lebanon, with uh, Palestinians, later with Syrians. So uh, there, there's a perspective there. But here we came, and in Madrid and Washington, there was a, a uh, an effort to start something, and it began with uh, questions of procedure, and a, a, as was mentioned in, in the corridors of the State Department, we tried to reach some kind of a balance between uh, 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 working with the Jordanians and with the Palestinians, having them also sit together. I won't go into that because of time constraints, but uh, the uh, right in the beginning, we uh, started uh, cataloging and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, enumerating the problems between us, and that was what I referred to earlier, mentioning Dr. Khadadin as the Common Agenda Agreement. That was initially confidentially uh, uh, initialed in November of 92, I believe, but it couldn't be made public until after the 
uh, Oslo Agreement with the Palestinians was signed in September of 93, the day after that, in a modest ceremony in the, uh, in the uh, uh, State Department, we had that uh, made public, that uh, agenda agreement. I can't go again into details of that, but that gave the basics of what later would develop and which is the last word of that agreement, the tre a treaty of peace. The Dr. Majali, by the way, who has a good sense of humor, uh, when we came to Washington again and again, and the Jordanians fell, uh, you know, the, 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 there was this, this the Palestinian uh, uh, channel and the problems and so Syria and and he and, and Lebanese and so on. He, he met, uh, you know, every culture there's a a. a uh, city of fools, like Chelem in the uh, Polish-Jewish law. In Jordan, two cities uh, compete. This is uh, Tafila and Salt. And two people from Salt, are, that's a Majali story, are in the uh, movie theater. And one says to the other, do you see the giant in the movie? He says, yes. He says, do you see the midget in the movie? He says, in a minute, the midget will kill the giant says, can't be a midget, a dwarf will kill a giant, says, let's bet. They bet, five dinar. A minute later, the uh, midget indeed kills the giant, and he comes to pay him the five dinar. He says, it won't be fair if I take. He says, why? He says, because I already saw the movie three times, and I knew it was going to happen. So the other guy says, you can take it. It will be fair. He says, why? He said, because I saw it already five times, but I thought maybe this time will be different. <laughs> and, uh, and Majali was hoping that this time will be different. Finally, it became uh, different. And uh, indeed, in the uh, uh, month after the uh, agenda agreement, uh, King Hussein and Prime Minister Rabin, in their meetings and their uh, and our very very intensive and extensive meetings finally came to the conclusion that it's time to move the negotiations uh, ahead and do it in the region, not in Washington. So in June of 94, and I'm really cutting a long story short, we, moved, we, start, we decided to move the negotiations to the uh, area. And indeed, the, uh, we had a first, it was a very dramatic week in the Jordanian-Israeli arena in July of 1994. We went first to, a, to demonstrate that we are going to work on the uh, boundary issues, on the water issues, etc. We moved to a tent in the Arava, uh, and I, in my speech, I said the tent, will, the tent is tentative, but peace will be permanent. And uh, we then had a first open meeting because we already had had a uh, confidential meetings in Jordan. I myself in the early meetings in 91 still went with a wig and I really looked like a macho and uh, I, I'm still dreaming of that wig nowadays when, when there's no hair to think of. And uh, the, uh, but then in, uh, in, in that, on that week for the first time we had a, uh, a uh, uh, meeting uh, chaired by Dr. Majali and, and uh, Shimon Peres, who was a former minister, in the, on the other side of the, uh, uh, on the, uh, well, other for us, the, this side for the Jordanians, on the uh, uh, eastern shore of the Dead Sea. And uh, then a few days later in Washington, we had the uh, Washington declaration between the Prime Minister Prime Minister Rabin and King Hussein. These were kind of antecedents or uh, prologues to the uh, finalizing of the negotiation. And let me talk about the substance for a minute. Uh, the, by the way, just to show the way we worked uh, and the confidence that when we came to Washington for that declaration, the Jordanians insisted that the, uh, we'll speak about uh, end of belligerency, which is or the termination of the state of belligerency is part of the peace. Now, this is a terminology taken from 242, the, uh, uh, the uh, UN 
Security Resolution 242. And uh, for me, by the way, I always uh, speak 242. I remember going to a doctor in Washington many years ago when I was the embassy, and I took a check, and he said everything is fine with you, except that you have a somewhat high cholesterol. He said, how much? He said, 242. I said, great for an Israeli diplomat. And ever since, I used to tell everybody, look, uh, for me, it's cholesterol. But in any case, uh, the, uh, that's the fact of life. But uh, I'm keeping that level somehow. And uh, the, uh, uh, when we came to Washington, the Jordanian said, uh, state of belligerency. Now, we already in the Egyptian Treaty of Peace put it, uh, termination of the state of war. Why? Because Prime Minister Begin explained to President Sadat at the time that uh, you go on the street in Jerusalem or somewhere, and uh, you, uh, you uh, ask somebody what is belligerency. Nobody knows what is belligerency. But war, everybody knows. So let's say peace and war. So, but the Jordanians said no, 242. Finally, the evening came, and the next morning is the signature. And we told the Jordanians, OK, if you insist, OK. But uh, we asked, and they went to the, uh, His Majesty, and he said, OK. If you are asked whether there's a difference from your point of view between belligerency and war, no difference. And sure enough, next morning in the ceremony in the White House, uh, the king himself, his majesty, uh, uh, starts his speech by saying, I was told that, uh, that we have here the word belligerency and people will not know what it means. And blah. Uh, let me tell you, what we are doing today is the termination of the state of war. So by that, the official interpretation was done and uh, it's not very important but it gives you the I, I'd like just uh, since uh, th there's very little time uh, to touch upon a couple of uh, substantial points one, one is the uh, boundary uh, the Israeli I think personally that the uh, one of the main achievements maybe the main achievement was uh, fixing the boundary uh, besides agreements on the water and other things. Why? Because this is something which had to be, you had to be creative. It never, uh, uh, it was never demarcated before. There was a, a uh, British mandatory definition of a line, which was never recognized as a boundary, but a line. And, uh, the, uh, and we had the armistice line, which again was never a boundary and never recognized as one. And the question was how to, to do the right thing in terms of the boundary so that what Jordan would like is getting back lands which were on the eastern side of the uh, armistice agreement and were uh, under our uh, military since the, the, the clashes in the, uh, in the 60s, 70s. And on our side, the Arava villages, Moshavim, Kibbutzim, were working land and 50% of their land, of the, not the villages themselves, the, the agricultural land was on that side. So we finally made an agreement, which was, we took a lot of, uh, for, for, uh, hopefully you can call it creativity, but in case that on one hand side, Jordan could honestly tell our people that they got back those uh, <coughs> 300 square kilometers, but on the other hand, uh, thank you very much. Oh, God bless you. This is our shepherd. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Generosity has always been a. Uh, uh, the. Uh, in fact, uh, you is re returning my story because when Ambassador Aid was uh, taking water, I said, "On whose share is this water?" <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the uh, and on the other hand, we had an, an exchange which is not mentioned specifically, but is ba basically in the uh, aerial photos which are attached to the agreement with the treaty, which. Uh, 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 there is some kind of an exchange of 40 square kilometers, uh, which we gave from uh, the Aravaya and given what uh, given by the 
uh, Jordanians, and the bottom line was that except for one place so far, which has a special regime like what's going on in Naharaim, all the rest of the uh, Arava uh, villages and kibbutzim, moshavim, have their, uh, their uh, working uh, fields uh, uh, under our sovereignty, and Jordan got back what it wanted in terms of the size of the, of the territory, and this is something which is more worth mentioning because it was indeed creative. The, I will not speak of the water issues because uh, my, the, the expert is here and he may, may uh, uh, refer to it. Uh, the, uh, I would just mention one more thing because uh, it is important. The bill said that we work together on the multinational force with Egypt that is in the late uh, 70s, early, 90, early 80s. With Jordan, the confidence between the leadership was such that there was no need for any multinational or, or UN or any, uh, in fact, right in the beginning when we started working with uh, General Burashet and his uh, colleagues, we fixed a direct line between us, not through UN or to any international third party or anything. And this confidence left the agreement such that while well, there's no uh, a, a, specific, a lot of specificity to it, that is, it's not specified in every word, the basic is that the two defense establishment are to interconnect uh, together, and this is what has been happening ever since the negotiations. Now, I, uh, I think that, uh, uh, that when we speak about, uh, about uh, uh, confidence, this is something which is worth mentioning and is very important. I would like to, uh, we don't have the time, so I'll conclude here by saying only this. And by the way, the uh, Ambassador Rosen mentioned the air flights. And again, I'm not, an, I don't know much about what's going on today in anything in the, uh, in, 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 in the uh, bilateral side, we signed a lot of uh, implementation agreements for the normalization in the next year after the Treaty of Peace, 94-95, which I still worked on, but, and I hear that the uh, economic uh, person outside, Mr. Barr, is here, and, and the people are working on, 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 on these things now. But as an anecdote, I remember we had, we, it wasn't easy with our own Air Force to get an agreement that after the treaty already, that. Uh, the Jordanian civil aviation will fly over Israel because the uh, Air Force was accustomed to, uh, you know, uh, walk all around and we had to find windows in terms of, and it was achieved with Prime Minister Rabin, myself working on it, finally we had it. And the first flight was King Hussein himself flying uh, his, he was, as you know, a pilot flying his uh, aircraft from, I think, London maybe, to uh, Amman on our, uh, in our airspace. And I remember being in Tel Aviv in my car and seeing the, in Netivea alone on the road in Tel Aviv, seeing the plane over my head, hearing in my car radio Prime Minister Rabin speaking to King Hussein on that occasion, and talking myself to Ambassador Taraune in Washington, who was the um, Jordanian ambassador, what did I say? At this very moment, I see your uh, uh, king above my head. I see the, uh, uh, and I hear our prime minister talking to him, and here I talk to you. So technology and goodwill and so on sometimes make you feel very good. Finally, uh, I a few times wrote when I still was writing on these things that peace is like a, a sort of a uh, plant. You plant it, that's not enough. You have to water it, you have to, water on both sides, I mean. You have to, uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, cultivate it, you have to work on it. And I hope that when we meet again in another conference, and I really want to thank the organizers of this conference, when we meet again uh, a few years or whatever, on the 20th anniversary, we'll be happy to see a Nice plan. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Justice Rubenstein. I now have the honor to introduce uh, Dr. Ambassador Professor uh, Munta Hadadin, the author of six books, many professional articles published in international journals. One book on the treaty together with Dr. Majali and Dr. Anani. That's right. A book on the treaty, and I know who's the big hero of the book. <laughs> Uh, courtesy professor at three univer U.S. universities, he has served the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan as Minister of Water and Irrigation, and was at the time the counterpart of Ariel Sharon, then Minister of National Infrastructure. He is a key member of the Jordanian delegations to the Middle East peace process. He was in charge of the files of water, energy, and the environment in the, uh, in the bilateral negotiations conference and head of the Jordanian delegation to the Water Resources Group, Working Group of the Multilateral Conference. In the Trilateral Economic Committee, he presented his own ideas on the integrated, integrated development of the Jordan Rift Valley, including the Red Sea, Dead Sea linkage. He successfully negotiated the same in the Bilateral Conference and assigned a special article for it in the Peace Treaty. He's one of the few Jordanians who worked uh, throughout with their Israeli counterparts, the peace treaty. That team worked diligently after the Washington Declaration of July 1994, and the efforts culminated in the peace treaty between uh, the two countries. He earned his first degree in civil engineering from Alexandria University in Egypt, his master's and PhD from the University of Washington in Seattle, the state of Washington, USA, and he's been highly decorated by King, the late King Hussein, and by foreign heads of state, and by the Greek Orthodox, Orthodox Patriarch of uh, Jerusalem, Dr. Hadadim. Thank you, Ambassador Brown. And thanks to the Truman Institute for extending the invitation to me to attend uh, the symposium. Uh, Ambassador Justice Rubinstein reminded me of so many events that took place during the negotiations and I remember I was standing in the corridor of the State Department with two other Palestinian delegates, uh, Mamdouh al Akar and uh, Hamad, that guy from Gaza, Abdurrahman Hamad. They had already spent, the, the heads of delegations, uh, Abdul Shafi, God bless his soul, Majali and Justice Rubinstein spent the previous day on the blue sofa in the corridor disagreeing. And Majali had briefed us that day on the obstacle facing them. And Majali said, said I said to Rubinstein, <coughs> why don't we go upstairs to the sixth floor where the brass of the State Department is, so that they can help us solve this impasse. And Rubinstein said, no, no, I will not go to the sponsor. And then Majali said, if we don't go to the sponsor, who do you think will solve this impasse? And Rubinstein says, maybe God will. And Majali said, even when God wanted to solve man's problems, he sent prophets. He sent Moses, and Rubinstein shot back. He said, that was Jewish. <laughs> he sent Jesus. He said, that too was Jewish. <laughs> he sent Muhammad. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> so the following day, that's when I saw him coming in the corridor. I was standing with these two Palestinian delegates. He ignores them extends his hand straight to me, and I shook his hands. He said to me, how are you? I said, fine, who are you? He said, fine. I said, I'm asking who you are. And he said, I'm Eliakim Rubinstein, head of the Israeli delegation. And I said, I'm Munder Haddadin, a member of the Jordanian delegation. He said, I know who you are. You were born to a Christian family in the village of Ma'in. Your childhood was this and that. You went to school here and there, and my entire CV, he recited it. <laughs> Who 
hoping that he would impress me, and he did. But I did not show hope. So I said, Rubenstein, Rubenstein, you must be the guy who's causing all these problems yesterday. Why are you doing that? He said, basically, because I am a very bad man. I said, if you are this bad, how did you manage to get married? He said, I fooled my wife. She's here, so... Uh, <laughs> he had already given me my CV. And when he said, I fooled my wife, I said, I'm so glad that you know me by now so well, because you would realize that you cannot fool me like you fooled your wife. <laughs> no, no, he said, I don't intend to. She gave me beautiful girls, and in Israel, they call me Abul Banat, and... The, at any rate, that was the beginning of my knowledge of uh, Rubinstein, a knowledge that he must have regretted over the coming, the, the following two and a half years, and I value so much then and now. Thank you, Ambassador Rubinstein, for taking part in that peaceful effort. Ladies and gentlemen, I owe this honor of being with you today to the Truman Institute who extended the invitation to me. For that, I am very grateful, and I'd like to extend my thanks to the organizers for all their care and effort to convene this symposium. I have lived my life in perpetual fear of the, of the danger that I was made to perceive Israel represented. Since I became aware of the surroundings in life in the mid-1940s, I remember hearing of the incidents reported between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. I was in second grade when the United Nations passed Resolution 181 in late November 1947. That partition resolution triggered demonstrations and strikes in Amman, and I remember the slogan that the demonstrators Demonstrators chanted, quote, Palestine is being robbed. Palestine is being robbed. I remember vividly the incidents across the ceasefire lines between Jordan and Israel, and on the other ceasefire lines with Egypt and Syria in the 1950s. I became aware of the ability of Israel to conduct sabotage in neighboring Arab countries in 1954 with the Lavon affair that brought down the government of Moshe Sharet. The Suez campaign was the next example of what Israel to us represented. Nine years later, the devastating Six Days War was a big eye opener. It opened our eyes on multiple facts related to Israel's military superiority and to the sands on which Arab castles were built. The aftermath signaled the fact that Israel is here to stay, and that it is not about to give up all the spoils of that war for nothing or anything. The unqualified support that the Western powers gave to Israel was a true eye-opener. The binoculars with which we in Jordan viewed justice were not shared by all humanity. We started to realize that adversity with Israel demands more than, more than stockpiling of hardware. It more required social, scientific, and cultural development. Our hopes went high to have a comprehensive settlement in the region following the UN Resolution 242. That's the level of cholesterol, Ambassador Rubinstein. <laughs> but these hopes soon evaporated, and the scene was ripe for the formation of paramilitary organizations that gained Arab support. In short, the outcome of the war and its aftermath of continued occupation of Arab lands and people primed the forces not of modernity, but of conservative, traditional, and religious groupings. The strength of these groupings manifested itself in various levels and forms in practically all Arab states. Moderate religious forces opted to follow the peaceful dialogue, like the case has been in Jordan, Tunisia, Sudan, and Morocco. But extremist groups opted for domestic violence 
in such countries as Algeria, Egypt, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, and others. And other more important or more extreme groups went global in their activities of spreading terror and attacking Western interests. Failure to achieve peace triggered more wars. The Yom Kippur War of 1973, the violence on Israel's ceasefire lines with Lebanon and in South Lebanon, the invasion of that country, that's Lebanon, by the Israeli Defense Forces in 1982 are evidence of such wars. Finally, the Palestinian Intifada against Israeli occupation in 1987, which subsided with the hopes associated with the peace process, re-emerged in 2000 when such hopes of achieving, achieving peace diminished. The violence that ensued in fresh, is fresh in our memories, and I need not elaborate. We have seen in live action how violence begets violence. Conversely, Making peace promoted the process of peacemaking. After Egypt made peace with Israel in 1979, the design of a Middle East peace process became possible in the wake of Operation Desert Storm. When Israel and the PLO exchanged political recognition in 1993 and signed the Oslo Accord, it was possible to proceed with the items on the common agenda between Jordan and Israel. When Israel and the PLO concluded the Cairo Agreement in May 1994, it was possible to have a meeting between the late King Hussein and the late Yitzhak Rabin on July 25, 1994, and for the king's aircraft to fly over Israel and circle Jerusalem on his way home. When more progress was scored on the Israeli-Palestinian front and the Israeli-Syrian front in the summer of 1994, it was possible to conclude, to conclude the Jordanian-Israeli Treaty on the morning of Monday, October 17, 1994. It was signed October 26, but on October 17, it was initialed by the foreign ministers of both countries, Perez on behalf of Israel and Najari as foreign minister also in Jordan. This is not to say that making peace was easy for peacemakers. But I do intend to know that making war is mighty easy for warmongers. As an engineer, I know that building a bridge takes time to design, finance, and build, but it takes virtually no time to destroy. Anyone who doubts my conviction may ask the Lebanese highway engineers and the Israeli Air Force pilots who flew missions over Lebanon in 2006, and, they bo and both sides will confirm it. In particular, achieving peace between Jordan and Israel was a laborious process that started in late October 1991 and ended mid-October 1994. It took 36 months and a lot of effort on both sides. The connectivity between the Jordanian and Palestinian tracks may have added challenges to both Israeli and Jordanian sides, but the mere idea of making peace with Israel the country with whom Jordan had been in a state of war for five decades seemed novel. The Israelis faced a joint Jordanian-Palestinian delegation throughout the period 1991-1993 when the Oslo Accords were made public. The negotiations were not easy. By the way, when the Oslo Accords broke out, as headlines in the Washington Post, New York Times. And, uh, I don't remember you, Eli, coming back. I think Itam bin Sur headed the, Jordan, the, the, headed the Israeli team and Tarawni, the Jordanian team, and Abdul Shafi, the Palestinian. Neither of the three or any members of these delegations realized what was happening. We didn't even know what to do. We spent about 10 days just idling, meeting and idling, doing nothing, because it was such a big surprise. Abdul Shafi then resigned, and we know what happened next. The neighbors, the negotiations were not easy, nor were the times we spent in Washington trying to make peace. There are many, story telling, many stories telling of the ups and downs of our moods, but I surely admired the resilience of the Israeli delegation members, 
particularly that of Ambassador Rubinstein, who had to face the delegation of an adversary in the morning and that of another adversary in the afternoon for four days every week. He never lost his sense of humor, except when he meant to, and was always very courteous in his dealings with the Jordanians. I remember stormy sessions for which Ambassador Rubinstein enjoyed blaming them on me. And I did not mind because he was right most of the time. <laughs> but I erased it from the history book. <laughs> <laughs> Majari was telling me, what is this? He said, we were sitting in a room in the morning. And Rubinstein was telling me how highly he thought of you. He was addressing me. And he said he wished he had not two, but one, like Haddadin in the Israeli delegation. He said, pretty soon, a guy knocked at the door. We were in the multilaterals in the same floor of the State Department. And I had an encounter with the Israelis with the usual type of verbal punches. He said, a guy knocked at the door. He asked for Rubinstein. Rubinstein stepped out of the room for a few minutes. Then he came back up. He came back into the room, closed the door, and he said to Majari, what is this Haddadin of yours? He is this, he is that, he's accused. So he said he was praising you one minute, and then the next five minutes he was <laughs> blaming you for being so nasty. We were two Jordanians. The crucial stormy session was in, on the evening of 27 October 1992, three days before the first anniversary of the Madrid conference. We were two Jordanians facing three Israelis headed by Ambassador Rubinstein to negotiate the common agenda of negotiations between Jordan and Israel. The session lasted four hours and a half and culminated in an agreement on the common agenda after 10 months of hard negotiations over its contents. On Thursday, the 29th of October, let me skip that one because it might open wounds. A push was given to the Jordanian-Israeli negotiations by the Washington meeting between King Hussein and Prime Minister Rabin, God bless their souls, and the Washington Declaration. King Hussein announced in the U.S. Congress on 26 July 1994 that the state of war between Jordan and Israel was over. The negotiators on both sides got down to accelerated serious business in early August 1994 on the Israeli side of the Dead Sea. My good counterpart, then not so good counterpart, Noah Kinarty is with us, and I was very pleased to see him today. He was there in those early days of August until the end. So the serious work started in the early week of August, first week of August 1994, on the Israeli side of the Dead Sea, and we concluded, they concluded their work in the Hashimiya Palace in Amman at about 11 a.m. on Monday, October 17, 1994. And that night, we did not rest for a minute. We did not sleep. It was just a non-stop type of operation until morning. Under Noach fell asleep on a couch and he was snowing <laughs> early in the morning. When I went to brief Rabin, I said, I, I can brief you on everything except for the water. <laughs> Why? Because Noach is now doing something which he never did and will never do, snowing on a royal couch. <laughs> <laughs> True. I <laughs> I left Noah Kinarty and uh, Daniel Reisner. I left them at about 6 o'clock in the morning because I was asked to rush to the Borders Committee and negotiate the last, the annex, one of the parts of the annex of the Borders. And so Noah must have uh, fallen asleep and s snored maybe, but I kept going. I kept going with uh, General Moshe Kazakhanovsky. Was the of the Ministry of Defense, yeah. I carried on with him, and he had three other colleagues. And we were only two. My fate in the negotiations was, I was always outnumbered, always outnumbered. The ratio went from two to one, 
to the peak ratio of 22 to 1. 22 to 1. The last week was particularly stressful, and the last night was unusually tiring. The negotiations marathon continued throughout that autumn night until the late morning hours. The treaty was initialed by the foreign ministers on that day, Monday, 17 October, and was signed in an international ceremony in Wadi Araba on 26 October 1994, and was ratified and exchanged on November 11, 1994. The implementation of the articles of the treaty and the ensuing agreements leaves a lot to be desired. The implementation was clouded by the demise, by the demise of the brave in Israel, who pushed for comprehensive peace with the Arabs. He was assassinated, not by a Palestinian, but by an Israeli. Extremists in Israel fueled the extremists in Jordan and elsewhere in the Arab world. Extremists reinforce each other, and conservative right-wingers do that too. It is to be emphasized that the Treaty of Peace with Jordan was predicated on the establishment of a comprehensive, just and lasting peace. This was stipulated in the goal of the Common Agenda and on its item C, in its item C, which stipulated that a peace treaty can be concluded after the goal of comprehensive peace was achieved. And it was also stipulated in the preamble of the Treaty of Peace. When the Israeli right assumed office in 1996, and again in 2000, the Palestinian-Israeli contacts were strained and violence dominated the scene on the ground. Innocent victims fell from both sides. Blood covered the streets where roses were once thrown, greeting the peacemakers and glorifying them. The presence of the peacemakers was missed and the peace camps on all sides shrank. As we celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Jordanian-Israeli Treaty of Peace, we ought to salute the political will that made the historic achievement possible. We have to promote that political will in the ranks of our two peoples and to encourage the achievement of the comprehensive, just and lasting peace in our area. I say this because the dreams we had as we concluded the peace negotiations were shattered. The warm peace that we thought was awaiting us turned into a cold one. 18 side agreements concluded under the peace treaty. Again, the Israelis were headed by Ambassador Rubinstein. These agreements await implementation in good faith. The flocks of tourists that we thought would flood each other's towns and cities dissipated. We can salute the implementation of the borders annex and the partial implementation of the water annex to the treaty. How can we explain a delay of 15 years in the full implementation of the water agreement under the treaty. How can we excuse such a delay or the misinterpretation of the text of the water agreement? There is a lot of terms in the treaty that we fell short of honoring. Does that serve the peace building? It is a challenge for all of us to regain the momentum of peace building and to turn the outcome of the peace treaty into a warm peace. We are to remember that the treaty is predicated on the achievement of just and lasting peace between the Arab states, including the Palestinians and Israel. The former president of the United States, George Bush, who was the staunchest supporter of Israel, kicked off the workable proposal of the two-state solution to be taken up along with the unprecedented Arab peace plan of 2002 to achieve the goal of peace and to start the process of peace building. We Arabs. We are once charged that we are a nation that does not read. This is an unjust and exaggerated view of the Arabs, just as the stereotype display of them in many Hollywood movies. But the failure of the Israelis to see the value to them in reaching a historic agreement with the Palestinians in particular and the Arabs in general suggests that Israelis do not read the history of our region. And if they do, they do not seem to learn important lessons of that history. It may take them some time to do so. And when they do, I am sure they will not regret it. We have to initiate the motions that will make us learn how to live with one another in peace. We have suffered a lot. You have suffered a lot. And the Palestinians have suffered even more than either of us. 
let us preach the chapters of the scriptures that glorify peace and the peacemakers who shall be known as the children of God. In the name of the Jordanian peacemakers, I salute the memory of our late King Hussein and the courage of the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. May God rest their souls in peace. In that spirit, we extend our hands to make our peace warmer than our summers and urge you to extend your hands to make it work. May the blessing of the one God motivate us all to achieve the just and lasting peace based on the two-state solution and the Arab peace plans. And God bless you all. If nothing else comes from this conference, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, to me personally, uh, it's so heartening to see that during the proceedings, a Chief Justice of, uh, a, a, a Justice of the Supreme Court of Israel, uh, exchanging notes in Arabic uh, with our next speaker. It's very encouraging indeed. I now introduce uh, Mansour, uh, General Mansour Abu Rashid, born in Amman, 1946, entered the Jordanian Military Academy of the Jordanian Armed Forces in 1965, where he trained to be an officer. In parallel, he also participated in special, specialized intelligence courses in Jordan and abroad. While in the uh, uh, Jordanian Armed Forces, he held positions of Jordan's chief delegate to the Joint Armistice Commission, director of jo uh, jo Jordan's military intelligence department, head of information and services br uh, sources branch, and information analysis officer. In these capacities, he received many awards for his outstanding service. He also received a uh, bachelor's uh, degree in law. As an inspiration to the legacy of the late King Hussein, immediately after the appointment of King Abdullah, General Mansour was asked to establish a non-governmental organization dedicated to promoting comprehensive peace and cooperation between Israel and Jordan. This led to the establishment of the Amman Center for Peace and Development, the ACPD. General Mansour remains keen on helping enhance peace efforts and believes in the necessity of living in peace as peace education helps build mutual confidence between conflicting party. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good day for all of you. I will go back to the 1990 when I was a member of the Jordanian military committee in Madrid conference. When I go back to Jordan, they appointed me as the head of the Jordanian, uh, Jordanian, uh, the, 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 excuse me, they appointed me as the head of the uh, uh, Jordanian Israeli uh, uh, Committee for the uh, peace uh, 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 negotiation between Jordan and Israel. On that days, uh, I was a, a colonel, and uh, then uh, I became, after that, the head of the intelligence department. Uh, I served in the army 35 years, and I want to say that I. Uh, I uh, uh, captured by the Israeli uh, uh, IDF in 1967 war in Jerusalem as a war prisoner. And then after that, I served in the Jordan Valley and I injured two times by the Israelis. And many of my colleagues, after that, they asked me how, how you are coming general and you are now uh, uh, be a, a peace man. I told him, the battle of peace, it's more strong and more difficult than the battle in the field. Uh, I saw many colleagues here who are participants with us to prepare for the peace from 1990 until 1994 when the delegations coming to the Arava Valley uh, and they met in the, in the tent as uh, Elia Kim, uh, he mentioned in his presentation. Uh, in fact, the cooperation between Jordan Army and the Israel Army started in 1990 after the Medish Conference, when a lot of Iraqis they uh, left Iraq, Iraq in uh, uh, Saddam Hussein regime, and they heard in the news that uh, Israel is a paradigm, paradise, and 
everyone who goes there, the Israelis will give him house, they will give him salary, salary, and they will give him also food and clothes. Many of them, they came to the area and start to cross the, the border illegally. And as you know, the Israeli, they have a very good uh, a wall or, or defense in the, in the northern area. And uh, everyone, he touched that fence. It, immediately, uh, the uh, patrol, the army patrol coming to the area, and they caught him. And if not, they killed him. Many Iraqis, they killed many Iraqi. They caught him, and some of them, they still, until now, in the jail. Uh, I remember uh, the ANSO, the United Nations True Supervision Organization, on that day, they were, uh, some of them, they were in the border, and they asked how we can prevent the, the Iraqis not, kill, not killed by the, the, the Israelis. Then I met my colleagues, General Baruch Shbigil, he was my counterpart in that area, and we put a plan without, without the United Nations uh, uh, people in, uh, in the area. And also, I will go back, uh, uh, when uh, Mr. Eliakim uh, mentioned about the border. Uh, there is two uh, areas. Uh, one in the north, they called it Nahraim in Arabic al Baqura, and the other is called it so far, Al Ghamr area in the in the south. Uh, when we started to, to demarket the, the, the border, we left these two areas for the decision makers because the negotiators, including Mr. Haddadin, they cannot come to a conclusion for uh, these two areas unless His Majesty, late Majesty King Hussein, and Ishaq Rabin, they came and they marked the area. The vision for the two leaders that we missed him a lot. The vision from that area, the Nahraim area, Nahraim it's in the triangle border between Syria, Jordan, and Israel. The vision of late King Hussein to have a research, a research agriculture center in that area for the whole region. He knows that one day the Lebanese and the Syrians will come and sign the agree peace agreement with the Israelis. And he lifted that area to be a center for research, agriculture research in that area. The other area, the Israelis, they invest a lot of money to use that area. It's a desert area. And um, uh, Sharon, Mr. Sharon, he was, when he was the uh, commander of the Southern Command, uh, he occupied hundreds of kilometers from our uh, area in the south in Wadi Araba, in Araba Valley. But in the agreement, they lifted until the uh, international armistice, armistic uh, uh, lines in that area. Uh, that area, we left it to the Israelis to use it. They don't have any rice. They are not owner of the area. They are using the area. And they wrote a special regime for that area. People, they can come in the morning, and they can go back before uh, the uh, sunset. Uh, in the north, uh, the area, the Israelis, they have a deeds for that. They have a Koshan, they have deeds. They own, they own the area, but even that, they put it in the special regime that the Jordanian authority can use this uh, area as they wish. But until now, we are, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, using uh, the, 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 the gate to allow to the people to come in the morning and they can go back. Uh, in, the, in the evening. Uh, I remember also one of the story, my colleagues, they are they talking about Sirs, uh, how much was the cooperation between the two armies in Jordan and Israel when the, one of the Jordanian soldiers, he killed seven kids 
in the north in the Bakura area, in the Haram area. And I remember Ishaq uh, Murdakhai. Uh, he was the minister of defense, and he was also in that in, on the same in the same time he's the, he was the deputy prime minister, and he came by his helicopter to the area, and he wanted to cr to cross to the Jordanian area with his weapon, with his soldiers, and by his jeeps. <coughs> Immediately, I was there. I stopped him. I told him, "You cannot cross with your weapons and with your." Uh, uh, cars. We, you can use our cars and you can go to the area and to see the area. And then they apply what I said because this is the treaty. If we broken the treaty from the first days, it's not good for the both sides. And then Uzi Dayan, he was the commander of the central command in that days. He came by helicopter and he asked to land in the area to see the kids. Some of the, of the kids are injured there. And we evacuated him to the hospital. And the Jordanian doctors, they made a very, very good surgery for the girls. Ozi Dayan, he came by car with a kids and with doctors, and he went to go to the room surgery. He said, Mansoor, we have to go there. We have to see the kids. We have to, to, to participate in the surgery. I told him, Ozi, look, you can do that in Israel, not in Jordan. You are in Jordan now. And if you not trust the doctors, if you not trust the doctors, you can do that. Let the doctors go inside. The Israeli doctors go on that side. The two doctors, they go inside to the surgery room, and they go back, and they talk to general they do the best. We cannot do more than what they did it. And then after that, they evacuated, evacuated by him by, uh, by the helicopter. The girls that evacuated by the IDF, unfortunately, they died in the, in the, in the way. From Sheikh Hussain Bridge to Al Afula Hospital. I am sad to say that, but the cooperation between the two countries was very good. And I saw Al Jazeera last Friday. I saw a program about the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel after 15 years. I was sitting with my family. And my family, they say, is this your picture? I told him. And they said, where the peace now? Did you look to the TV this morning? What the Israeli police doing in Al Haram Al Sharif in Jerusalem? Are you still believe in peace? Unfortunately, the program was fooled by the anti normalization movement in Jordan. And those people are very strong. Those people, they have unions, they control the unions, they control some of the parties, and they control some of media. But I will let you know that the majority of the Jordanian, they need peace with the, with the Israelis, but they need a just and comprehensive peace with the Israelis. They don't want it to see our brothers, the Palestinian, killed by the Israeli soldiers. We need a peace, comprehensive, just peace for all the region. I heard also Mr. Yaqub Rosen when he talked about the visa issue. And I saw many colleagues from the uh, foreign ministry here. I know that the, 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 uh, the, the visa issue, people, they recognize it it as a slide or a small issue. But in fact, it's not. I am sure that my colleagues in the foreign ministry and the ambassador himself, he do a lot. I remember when he stay in the weekend waiting visa from the security department on, on Friday and on Saturday, waiting visa to come for the people to go to Israel and to participate in some mutual project. I admire him, 
but also I, I have to say in this distinguished group that the visa issue in the Jordanian street, it's a big issue. I cannot imagine when I invited by the Israeli to participate in arts festival in Al Hola in the north. I asked by the SPNI to go there with nine kids or ten kids to participate in that festival. And Shumran Paris, Mr. Shumran Paris, he was there also. Nine years old and ten years old, the participants. Can you imagine they wait until the last minute to have a visa from the Israeli embassy in Jordan? Nine years and ten years. What is record in the security department here in Israel? And Israel is a very advanced country. People in security department here, they can't check anybody in all the world in five minutes. We don't need it to stay two months to get visa from the security department in Israel. This kind of issue, it hurts a lot of a Jordanian. Business people also want to come here and to deal and to have contract, talk with the Israelis. In fact, they didn't get visa. Some of them, they stayed three months, four months, five months to get visa. The problem not in the foreign ministry or in the embassy. The problem is in the security department in Israel. They didn't pay any attention about the relationship between Jordan and Israel. And as a peace camp in Jordan, we are struggling with the others. And the peace camp in Israel almost di di disappear now. There is no voice for the peace camp in Israel. Where is the demonstrations here? I saw when Rabin assassinated, how many people they go for demonstrations. When also invade Lebanon, how many Israelis de demonstrate against the occupied of Lebanon? We don't see Israelis now, leaders or public opinion now, are keen or committed to have a peace with the Arabs. The Arabs, they gave the Israelis the Arab initiative and our ambassadors, Mr. Ali al he mentioned about that. It's not, it's not initiative between Jordan and Israel. It's initiative between 57 states from the Muslim and the Arab countries. The Muslim world. And the Excellency he mentioned also about the carrot and the mango. You can see carrot and mango in the shelf of some supermarket in Jordan. The idea is not to have mango or carrot. The idea to have a mutual interest between the people. To have some interest between the Jordanian and Israelis to achieve a peace and just and, and comprehensive peace. I prepared, in fact, a presentation, 10 paper presentation, but after what I heard from my colleagues here and in the morning, I stop here and I hope that the next year we celebrate in a better atmosphere and a better willings between the Arabs and Israelis. Thank you very much.